Hi everybody, this is Mrs. Costello. I'm gonna go through some of the, uh, I'm gonna go through the odds on the test review. Uh, I believe the answers are already on Teams. So if you've already checked them and there's one that you really wanna see, you're more than welcome to skip ahead in the video uh, to where I get to that one um, or just watch you know, as you need, but I'm gonna go through every single odd problem right now. So uh, for one and three, the directions say to simplify. So you're either gonna be adding, subtracting, or multiplying these um, binomials or trinomials. On number one, in between the two trinomials, there is a minus sign, which means I'm going to distribute the negative sign to everything in the second parenthesis, and I'm gonna leave the first parenthesis alone. So the first one is just 4x squared minus 2x plus nine, then when you distribute your negative, um, negative 5x squared becomes positive 5x squared, 5x becomes negative 5x, and then four becomes, negative four becomes positive four. Once you distribute, all you're doing is combining like terms. So 4x squared and 5x squared are like terms. They make 9x squared then um, negative 2x and negative 5x combine to make negative 7x. And then we also have 9 and 4, and those guys are going to combine to make 13. So this whole thing should be your answer on number 1, because that's that thing simplified. Um, you're not factoring it. You're not doing anything else. Number three, there is no plus sign or minus sign like in between those two parentheses. So this is a multiplication problem. If you had two binomials, like this is a binomial, um, and then if you had another one, you would just double distribute. But this whole thing is a trinomial. So you're going to, I guess, triple distribute each term in the binomial. So we'll start with A first. So we're gonna distribute the a to everything in the trinomial. So a times 2a squared is 2a to the third. a times negative 5a is negative 5a squared. And a times three is 3a. Now I'm gonna do the exact same thing with the negative four. Make sure that you distribute the negative two because it's, um, it's part of the four. So negative four times 2a squared is negative 8a squared. Negative four times negative five a is positive 20 a. And then negative four times three is negative 12. Now, just like the last one, all we need to do is combine our like terms. Um, if I'm looking at this, two a cubed does not have any like terms, so I'm gonna leave it alone. And then I do have some like terms with the a squared. Five a squared, sorry, negative five a squared, minus eight a squared, is negative 13a squared, and then 3a plus 20a is 23a, and then negative 12 does not have a like term, so we just write it right there. So this would be your answer on number three. Okay, I'm done there, I combined all the like terms, that's as simplified as it gets. All right, um, four through six is solving equations or inequalities, depending on what you have. Number five, which is the one I'm gonna do, is an equation. All right, so if you draw your line, cool, in between, you know, each side, separating each side of the equal sign, uh, go through your checklist, go through your order of operations, right? P's for parentheses. There is parentheses and there's distributing that needs to happen. So I'm gonna distribute right there. So five times x is five x. Five times negative four is negative 20. And then on my other side, I have five x plus 12. All right, now when I'm solving equations, I like to get rid of the smaller letter. So I have five x and five x. They're the same, so it does not matter which one I get rid of. So I know I have to subtract five x on each side though to get rid of it. So those guys are gone. So I have negative 20 equals 12, 
So when something like this happens, I have to ask myself, like, did I just get a true statement? Is negative 20 equal to 12? It's not, so this is a no solution. There is no x that's going to work for both of those. That's going to make them equal. 7 is a graphing one. So on number seven, I do need to get this into slope-intercept form. It's not yet. We need to get y equals. So we're going to divide by negative three on each side. Now I know you're looking at it and you're going, wait a second, it's missing the x, right? Um, yeah, when I divided, sorry, when I divided, I got six divided by negative three, which is negative two. There's no uh, x in slope. This is a special line. This is y equals negative two. So like on my graph, I would find negative two on the y-axis, it's right here. Now I'm gonna draw a line, it's gonna be a horizontal line because that's our y equals line. You wanna make sure it goes through the y-axis um, and everywhere along that line, y is gonna be negative two. That is how I draw that line. If you had an x equals, you would have a vertical line. So horizontal is the y equals, the vertical is the x equals. So that's how you would do number seven. Okay. Um, nine through 11 is writing equations with um, the information. So sometimes you have a slope, sometimes you don't. In number nine, you don't have a slope, okay? So we're, we might have to use that slope formula. So you want an equation for a line going through the origin the origin is 0, 0, so I'm going to write that down for sure. And then another point is 7, 3. So I'm going to find my slope first, which means I'm going to use that slope formula. So y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Okay, uh, this guy, this is going to be my x1, y1. This is going to be my x2, y2. So if I plug in everything, uh, y2 is 3, th 3 minus 0 over x2 is 7 minus 0. Okay. So that's my slope. Now our goal is to write an equation in slope-intercept form. Slope-intercept form is y equals mx plus b. I just found m, it was 3 over 7, right? This is my slope. I need the y-intercept, which is b. Now you have some options. You could plug it in, use HK form, whatever, but be smart on this one. You actually have the y-intercept, okay? The y-intercept is going to be zero. Whenever you have zero for your x, like you do here, right? This is zero for the x, then the next thing is, is your y-intercept. So zero comma b. So if you're writing your equation, you could write y equals 3 over 7x plus 0, or you don't even have to have that plus 0. You could write it as y equals 3 over 7x, like that. So um, I would accept either of these two equations on my test. I can't speak for the other Algebra 2 Honors teachers, but maybe check with them. But I would be fine with either of those equations on my test. 11. I like 11. Um, it says a line with an x-intercept of 4 and then a y-intercept of negative 2. Now these are two separate points. A lot of the times I see you guys putting this as one point. These are two different points. So x-intercept of 4 looks like this, 4, 0. y-intercept of negative 2 is 0, negative 2. Again, my goal is to get y equals mx plus b. So I'm going to repeat the same process I used on the last one. We got to do our slope formula first. x1, y1, x2, y2. So when I'm finding the slope, remember it's y2 first, so y2 is negative 2 minus y1 is 0 over x2 is 0 minus x1 is 4. Negative 2 minus 0 is negative 2. 0 minus 4 is negative 4. Let's clean that up though. Let's make that 1 half for my slope. Okay, so this is my m. 
Now again, be smart on this one. For B, you could plug into HK form or it said in there Y intercept of negative two. So you already have it, right? So this guy, negative two, can go right here in your equation. So I can go ahead and write Y equals one half X minus two for my equation. That would be a good answer on my test, and I'm sure your other algebra teachers would be fine with that. Even though you didn't show some work for HK, you didn't have to. You can, it's just more work for you. 13 is solving using any method. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of look at this and go, okay, um, which would be easiest for me to use? All right, so I have 2x plus y equals negative 1 and 6y equals 4x plus 6. So this one's kind of cool because I think both methods like could work pretty well. So I'll go ahead and do one of each. I'll do substitution and I'll do elimination. I'm not going to graph it because I don't think that's going to go very well. But if you really want to graph it, you can. So if using a substitution perspective, I think it's easier to get y by itself in your first equation. And I'm sure some of you guys would agree. So you would just have to move that 2x by subtracting it. So y equals negative 2x minus 1. So this is what y is right now. A, lot, a common mistake you guys make is you plug it back into the equation you just touched. You always put it into the equation you haven't touched yet, which is your second one. So if I sub into the second one, I'm going to have 6 times everything that y is, negative 2x minus 1 equals 4x plus 6. Now I have only x's, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and solve for x. So distribute the 6. I now have negative 12x minus 6 equals 4x plus 6. Okay, I'm going to move the 12x over. So I have negative 6 equals 16x plus 6. I'm going to have to move off to the side. I have too much work. There we go. Okay. So move the 6 over. Minus 6 minus 6. I get negative 12 equals 16x. And then I'm going to divide on each side by 16. And I'm going to get negative 3 fourths uh, for x. So not, not the best, um, but that's okay. When I go to sub back in to find y, and I look at this, I'm going to erase the highlights on y really quick. If I look at these two equations that I started with, I know it's going to be a little bit easier to plug into this one because I know you're multiplying by 4, which would clear out that denominator. So I'm going to choose to plug into the second equation. You can plug in to the first one if you'd like to. Um, again, this is your problem, so it, there's multiple ways to do it. So don't stress if you're not doing it the way I, I am. So if I sub back in to find y, this is the one I'm going to use, and I'm going to sub in negative 3 fourths for x. So 6y equals 4 times negative 3 fourths plus 6. Right Now when I multiply, right, these guys go away. So I have 6y equals negative 3 plus 6. Okay, uh, negative 3 plus 6 is just 3, so 6y equals 3. Divide by 6 on both sides, and I know that 3 over 6 is 1 half. So my solution would be negative 3 fourths and 1 half. That's doing it with substitution. If you want to see it done with elimination, um, I am going to erase everything right now, so pause it if you need the work, but I'm going to erase it all and I'm going to do it with elimination. All right, so while I'm doing it with elimination, remember you don't have to do it this way. So first thing I always do is check the x and y are on the same side on both equations. The first equation is good. The second equation, we do need to move over that 4x. 
So negative 4x plus 6y equals 6. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stack it right under my second one. Or sorry, my first one. So negative 4x <clears throat> plus 6y equals 6. Now if I look at this to eliminate, I have opposite signs on the x's, right? The top x is positive 2, the bottom x is negative 4. But I don't have opposite coefficients. So I need to turn this 2 into a 4. And I can do that if I just multiply the whole first equation by 2, which means everything is going to get multiplied by 2. So this becomes positive 4x plus 2y equals negative 2. Now I have opposites in the x's, so when I add straight down, they cancel. So 6y plus 2y is 8y, and then 6 minus 2 is 4. And then we just divide by 8, and I get y equals 1 half. Okay, a little bit simpler finding that first variable. Now let's look at our two equations. Think about which one would be easier to plug into. If I plug into the first equation, you're going to be working with a fraction like the whole time. If I plug into the second equation, I have a 6 next to the y, and I know I can easily multiply that by 1 half, so I'm going to pick the second equation to plug my y into. So 6y equals 4x plus 6. So 6 times 1 half for y equals 4x plus 6. 6 times a half is 3. And now I have a two-step equation to solve, so not bad, right? Minus 6 on each side. And I get negative 3 equals 4x. Divide by 4 on each side. And I'm going to get negative 3 fourths for my x. And then again, I am going to write that as an ordered pair, so negative 3 over 4 and 1 half. So those were the two ways that I would do it. I wouldn't recommend graphing it, um, but it's your call. So number 15 is a system with three variables. I You could do this by hand, but... Mrs. Robeson is going to make a video with the calculator. I can't get the calculator app to load onto my computer. So there's going to be a separate video for number 15 if you need number 15. Because I feel like it would be best if you could like see the calculator versus me going, yeah, I'm putting this in my calculator. So see uh, Roby's video. Seventeen's a domain and range. Okay. So I'm gonna I've been using interval notation in my classroom. I don't really know what the other teachers have been doing, but I'll do an inter interval and an inequality. So the domain, remember the domain is the x's and the range is the y's. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually find these points and label it. So this first point is at negative one, two, three, four, five, six, seven negative 7 and 1, and then this second point, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6, negative 6. All right, so on the domain, you always go smallest to biggest on your interval, so my smallest would be negative 7. It is a closed circle, so I'm going to put a bracket, and then positive 6 is my biggest, also has a closed circle, so I'm going to put a bracket. Now I know other teachers might have been teaching the inequality, so the x is going to be in between negative 7 and 6, and it's going to have um, less than or equal to signs. So that would be the other way to write it. Now the range is the y's, and I'm going to do the exact same thing. My smallest y is actually down here at negative 6. So I'm going to start with negative 6, and then my biggest y is positive 1, right? You go bottom to top on the range. You go left to right on the domain. And then if you're doing inequality notation, it would just be y is in between negative 6 and 1, like that. All 
right, 19 is another domain and range, but we have a list of points. So when you're doing your domain, remember we're still talking about the X's. So this is an X, this is an X, right? The, all of those are the X's. So I would make a list of those guys in my curly brackets because that means um, the set of. So two, negative two, four, and zero are all the X's. They didn't repeat at all, but you never list them twice. And then the ranges are the Y's. So five, four, oh, hey, we got another five and we got another four. So our range is gonna be a short list because you only have to list those numbers once. So just five and four on the range for that one. All right, 21. So 21 wants me to evaluate the piecewise given the domain. So we're looking at x equals four for the first one. So when I go through the um, domains over here, I have to ask myself, which one, which equation am I allowed to use? Which one works for x equals four? So like on this first one, is four less than negative one? It's not, so I'm not gonna use that one. Okay. The second one is four um, greater than or equal to negative one. Yeah, it is, um, but is it less than four? It's not, so I'm also not gonna use that one. And then my last one, is four less than or equal to four? Yes, it is. And is it less than 10? Yes, it is. So I would use this. Now, there's nothing to plug into, right? There's no X on that. So that means everywhere on that line, like the Y is gonna equal four or five. So that's all I have to do on 21. That's my only answer on that one. I don't have to plug into anything. It's pretty nice. Now I have a graphing piecewise. Okay. So the way I do it, and I know that different teachers do it differently, is I put in my domain restriction first. I call it a boundary. So x equals zero is the boundary, which is right here on the x-axis. Or sorry, on the y-axis, my bad. So see how I made it kind of orangey? So then you can see like this is my boundary. Now what I do is I graph them one at a time like normal, but I'm gonna do some erasing. So like my first equation, I if I'm graphing it like normal, I would say, okay, the slope is two, and then the y-intercept is one. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna graph it just like normal, um, but I'm gonna do some erasing, so I'm not actually gonna draw any lines. I'm just gonna make, I'm just making dots going up two over one and I'm doing that on each side of my boundary. Now, again, I know different teachers teach it differently. This says greater than or equal to, and it's pointing to the right. So I'm only gonna graph it on the right side of my boundary. So I'm gonna draw my line just on the right side, and I'm going to erase these dots that are on the left side. Now the last thing I need to check for is open or closed circle. This one has a line under it, so I know it's a closed, so I'm gonna make it kind of exaggerated, right? A big closed circle. <clears throat> now I'm gonna do the same thing for my second line. My second line, I'm gonna do it in green. My slope is negative one, my y-intercept is positive one. Exact same thing. I'm gonna start at one, I know there's a big circle right there, but that's okay and then I'm going to go down one over one, down one over one. Now I know some of you guys are going, hold on a second, why are you graphing on the same side as that other one? Okay, I'm only doing it just to kind of help you guys get the correct slope, because I know some of you make that common mistake, and when you see a negative slope, you just go to the left, and that's not, we don't do that, okay? So, uh, let's see, I know I'm going to erase everything on the right side because I already drew a line on the right, so there's no way my second line's gonna be on the right side of my boundary. It's gonna be on the left, so I can go ahead and connect the dots on the left side. Now I know it kind of overlaps with that closed circle, 
if you can kind of make it so I know I did it in two colors but do you see how I have like an exaggerated open circle there that shows me that you still have an open circle on one and a closed circle on one this is kind of a unique one where they both end up on the same place so just do your best on that one all right one more we want to graph a step function to represent the situation okay so this is saying like the weight if the weight's in between i think there might be like a story maybe somewhere i don't know um so i think you're buying like fruit or something and if the weight's in between zero and three pounds you're gonna pay ten dollars for like a bag of fruit or whatever i'm just making up a situation so the weight is going to be the x okay so if you want to label like weight right here and then y the cost is always y money always goes on the y-axis so i'm going to kind of go back and forth between the table and my graph because i'm going to zoom in uh let's see So the x-axis goes up to 10. If you want to do it by ones, you can. If you want to label it by twos, you also can. It's going to be a tight squeeze if you do twos. So I'm just going to go like this, 11, 12. You can do that however you want. I'm pretty sure the cost is going up by $5. So I'm going to make fives on my y-axis. So 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, right? Just to kind of make things easier. Okay, so I, got, I kind of got to go back and forth from the table, or I could do this really, really, really teen tiny. So the first part right here, from zero pounds to three pounds, uh, open circles, right? Because there's no line under there. It's going to cost 10 bucks. So from zero for the X, I'm going to find 10. And I'm going to put an open circle right there. Then to three pounds, three pounds is also going to have an open circle. And I'm going to draw my line like that. That's going to be the first step of my function. I'm going to zoom back out to find do the rest of it. Okay, second one says three pounds to six pounds. With some closed circles, it's going to be 15. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my graph. And I'm going to do the same thing. Okay, I'm gonna find three. I'm gonna put a closed circle on 15 because that's what it said. And then all the way to six, it's gonna be 15 pound or fifteen dollars. Okay, so three pound three pounds to six pounds, you're gonna pay fifteen dollars for your bag of fruit. I got two more steps on this step function. Uh six to nine is twenty pound or twenty dollars. Now, be careful on this because on six, you're going to have an open because there's no line. But then on nine, you're going to have a closed because there is a line. So six is open, nine is closed. And that makes sense because the one below it, you had a closed circle on six. Remember, there can only be one closed circle per uh, X. And then one more. From nine to 12 it's gonna cost $25. So nine pounds to 12 pounds is 25. And the nine has an open, sorry, I forgot to say that. And then the 12 should have a closed, and that's the end of my step function. And that's the end of the review. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask me or feel free to ask uh, your Algebra to Honors teacher. Um, I hope you guys have a good rest of your day and that you're ready for your test this week.